An attempt at defining naturalism can be quite difficult, seeing as vagueness is apparently written directly into any definition. Some insist that it's the belief that everything that is, is directly observable via the scientific method. In less practical terms, in relation to its investigation at least, <laughs> some say that naturalism is the claim that everything that is can be explained in natural terms. Gravity, atomic forces, dark matter, black holes, and all sorts of things we don't fully understand yet. Yet is the key word, and it unlocks the door of hope that this philosophical worldview seems to hold, that many philosophers, and crucially, scientists hold quite dearly. It allows for the vacuum of human knowledge surrounding the expansive topics of existence that we're still at odds with and valiantly fighting against. It allows for the rapid change in scientific knowledge that the 20th and 21st centuries have shown can be the impetus for social upheaval, for better and for worse, depending on how honest the science and its communication is. It allows for us to be wrong, as science often discovers itself to be, a fact which is undeniably hopeful and, dare I say, human. Not too bad of you, is it? The intertwine between the natural and the man-made. Or depending on your worldview, just the natural. <laughs>
Using that Louisian logic, he puts forth an argument on behalf of the supernatural, which is certainly interesting, though not fully convincing. And herein lies the problem of philosophy in general. <laughs> Using that same Louisian logic, one can construe any multitude of meanings. In the same book he says, No philosophical theory which I have yet to come across is an adequate improvement upon the words of Genesis that, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. The idea of creation, in the rigorous sense of the word, is there fully grasped. To Lewis, this is a line that reaffirmed Christianity. A naturalist, though, could hear any man say exactly that and proclaim, yes, exactly that. That's right, that's right. Though the God that the two men speak of would be wildly different. The naturalist God would be more classically Eastern, as much as that terminology is far too binary, it is useful in this case. And the Christian's God would be a personal creator God, outside of space and time, capable of providence, blah blah blah, whatever. These two gods aren't the same being, or really not even the same type of being. Joseph Campbell rationalizes this gap in his typical universalistic fashion thusly. <clears throat> Briefly formulated, the universal doctrine teaches that all the visible structures of the world, all things and beings, are the effects of a ubiquitous power out of which they rise, which supports and fills them during the period of their manifestation, and back into which they must ultimately dissolve. This is the power known to science as energy, to the Melanesians as mana, to the Sioux Indians as Wakanda, and to the Hindus as Shkati, and to the Christians as the power of God. Its manifestation in the psyche is termed, by the psychoanalysis, libido. And its manifestation in the cosmos is the structure and flux of the universe itself. And this rationale is comforting. We're all looking at the same thing, such a lovely thought. But so many people are not looking at, or more precisely for, the same thing. A deistic naturalist sees God as necessarily pantheistic or maybe panentheistic, while a Christian sees God as a theistic personal being. If I look at a guitar, and call it a guitar, and someone objects that it's actually a violin, there's at best a miscommunication, and at worst a complete fracture in reality. <laughs> if God exists, then we can't all be right about it, especially if our right hinges on someone else being wrong. Some can be all right, all can be a little right, but we can't all be all right. I think Bob Dylan said something like that. <laughs> How does a naturalist then claim to believe in God? It seems like the necessary definition of God in this philosophical worldview is at best just what is, <laughs> which many people can find justifiably limp-wristed. Carl Sagan, in an attempt to define God, used Einstein as an example of someone who used God language, but didn't apparently mean more than that, saying, Einstein was constantly interpreting the world in terms of what God would or wouldn't do, but by God, he meant something not very different from the sum total of physical laws of the universe, that is, gravitation plus quantum mechanics plus grand unified field theories plus a few other things equaled God. And by that, all he meant was that there was a seat of exquisitely powerful physical principles that seemed to explain a great deal that was otherwise inexplicable about the universe. I don't think Einstein would have called himself a naturalist, though, because he was off being one. I don't know. Once again, it's vague. The now famous letter that sold for $2.1 million, written by Einstein, titled The God Letter, affirms Einstein's distaste for religion, which naturalism is distinctly not, and in a similar way Sagan himself seems to fit this once again vague definition of naturalist, frequently pointing out how, as scientific knowledge increases, the realm of the religious becomes more abstract, saying, as science advances there seems to be less and less for God to do. It's a big universe, of course, and he, she, or it can profitably be employed in many places. But what has clearly been happening is that evolving before our eyes has been a god of the gaps. That is, whatever it is we cannot explain lately is attributed to God's realm. The theologians give that one up, and it walks over onto the side of science. The dusty roster. 
relatably Sagan searches for God in the scientific world and ends up in this exact realm of philosophy with the question, if we are merely matter intricately assembled, is this really demeaning? If there is nothing in here but atoms, does that make us less or does that make matter more? Many find meaning in their faith and naturalism posits the possibility that meaning is intrinsic. <laughs> Maybe our existence ought to be enough reason to sing. And if we so desperately need a definition of the sacred, maybe that definition can simply be this. A lovely day under a cool window. It's okay, isn't it? So what about naturalism then? It makes people think it might be the all right all the time. It uses existence as variable proof no pure logic or pure faith here. It is what it is, and it says there could not be anything else. Much like how agnosticism can seem like a lazy man's atheism, naturalism can seem like a valid philosophy for those who are not particularly interested in making a definite stance on philosophy. Many of those cited in this film are not professional philosophers, rather maybe more accurately defined as popular thinkers, many of which probably could be shoehorned into the category of naturalist, though that shines on the metaphorical light of the problem of all categorizations. They're either too vague to be beneficial, or too broad to be correct. Regrettably though, humans are necessarily patterned beings, so let's attempt some of it. Were Sagan and Einstein naturalists? Probably. <laughs> Was Lewis? No, probably not. How about Campbell? Depends on how you define God. Am I? Probably, though I sometimes wish I wasn't. To use a horrendously useful cliché, in conclusion, naturalism posits that nothing exists that cannot be determined by scientific investigation, which certainly still leaves room for mystery, as we do not, and very probably cannot, know everything there is to know, but implies that if there is a divine being pulling all the strings, might as well just call it the strings itself. And as always, thanks for watching.